If you have any questions or comments, please type them um, and submit them through the Q&A chat box on the bottom right of your screen. Note that we will be holding all questions until the end of the presentation. Please note that you can download the slide deck right now by selecting the document on the right and clicking Download Files. So I am pleased to introduce our guest speakers for today's webinar, Don Baldong and April York. Don is the principal at Impact Solutions and has extensive experience in advancing educational work workforce and practice development program <coughs> offerings in the areas of enhanced senior care, palliative and end-of-life care, and mental health and addiction care and services. Don has been actively involved in knowledge translation, advocacy, political action, and workforce development to advance health and system priorities at the international, national, provincial, and regional levels. Don was a member of MHCC's first cohort of the SPARC training program in 2013 and has since returned um, as a mentor. April York is the Mental Health Commission of Canada's digital marketing expert. She joined the MHCC just over a year ago with 10 years of social media experience. She has a bachelor's degree in communication and has a certification in advanced social media strategy from Hootsuite and the University of Syracuse. Welcome both Dawn and April. We'll start with Don. Don, over to you. Thanks so much, Sarita, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the Mental Health Commission of Canada and the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction for the opportunity to present today to the KE Collaborative and its growing membership. The title of today's presentation is Compelling Others to Act with SBARA. So let's begin with a bit of a scenario that I'm sure, or quite likely sure, will be familiar to many of you. Have you ever wondered why something that seems to make so much sense to you may not be considered important by others? Do you ever get frustrated when trying to share an idea or a recommendation or change idea with others? Have you ever thought to yourself, if only I could get them to see how important this is? Or have you ever wondered why what seemed to be a great exchange of ideas with someone really never went anywhere. I would imagine many of you would be able to relate to some of those statements or some of those questions. So it's true that we're receiving more information throughout the course of the day than we have at any other time in history. There's an awful lot competing for our attention. Everything seems to be a priority. It could be simply because um, of what some people refer to as the signal-to-noise ratio that others aren't seeming to get your message. So when the signal or your message, your key message, is drowned out by a lot of noise or other information that isn't salient or directly supporting your key message, you have a harder time in, in having your key message understood uh, by the receiver. It may be related to the influence of power in politics that you're not able to get an idea across or to get action on an idea you have. Or perhaps it may be because you've just not been clear in the argument you were making. So we hope to provide some help uh, along those lines for you today as you think about structuring communications with stakeholders. So today we'll introduce an easy to use and, and uh, easy to use and remember tool for communicating your change ideas and compelling others to act. We'll discuss how the SBARA tool has been applied in certain circumstances, and we'll define key information to include under the dimensions of SBARA. And I'll also leave you with an application exercise that you can work on uh, to build your strengths in this area. So I believe we'll go now to poll number one to get us started. So I'm just opening up the first poll question, which is, when speaking with someone about an idea you have that could really make a difference, on which of the following are, the mo are they most likely to base their decision on, uh, ba base their decision to help? Um, please select one. We'll give you a few minutes to complete the poll.
interesting results so far. We'll give you guys a couple more seconds to complete the poll, and then we will end it. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. And those are the results. So 61.5% um, said how well the idea aligns with their agenda, 23% um, said quality of your argument for or against, um, so the evidence, and 15, just over 15% said cost. So very interesting results, and I can advance the next slide now and say that was probably quite a frustrating exercise for you to complete because, in fact, to be, to be forced to identify only one factor is somewhat problematic, as you all know. People typically consider a great number of factors all at once when they're listening to you or considering what you're proposing. But it's also be able, it's important for them to be able to follow you when you're explaining a new idea or a proposed solution to a problem. So some of the things people might think about, they, it would be inappropriate to think in terms of cost alone anymore when we talk about the health system and, and health healthcare policies or, or health services that we're, we're wanting to introduce, it would be inappropriate to think only about it being innovative and, and, and jazzy and something new alone. And it would be obviously in, inappropriate to think about any of these things in isolation. People are motiv motivated by different things, by different agendas, and it was interesting that you note how well this fits into someone's agenda or what they're trying to achieve as being a really key factor in determining how successful you'll be at landing your argument or your uh, proposed change solution. So again, it could be a great idea, wow, this is a novel idea, or this will help us achieve our organizational ends, or this will help us build partnerships or expand on certain partnerships we have or deepen them. Or this could help us bring value to money, value for money in, in our services that we're providing. Or this could allow us to improve our working processes and, and our efficiencies. Or this just could be a very timely idea that, wow, this solution comes at the right time and people are more willing to buy into it because it's salient in terms of what's currently going on or what the current problems facing the organization may be. So it can be quite complicated and we want to decrease the level of complexity through which we're communicating with somebody. We want it to be simple because we know that there's a lot competing. There's a lot of competing agendas out there, and we want our message to be heard clearly and resonate with the person who's receiving the message. So I, I show for an example here in this slide the influence of ideas, interests, and institutions. When we think about federal government, for instance, they have multiple people wanting to speak with them and offering their ideas, be they evidence-based or be they be they politically driven or be they backed by political ideology. They have, there's a lot of interest groups out there, as you know, and there are, there are institutions that may preclude them from acting on certain recommendations, such as laws or regulations in Canada. So we wonder then, how can we get heard and receive the support we need when we have to communicate something to a stakeholder, knowing that there is a lot of competing demands? for their attention. So today we'll be talking about a tool. Now this is the current version of the tool that has been used uh, broadly, and I'll talk about this in a minute. But let's think about the, the term SBAR as representing situation, background, assessment, and recommendation, and we'll move from there. So initially SBAR was introduced in the military as a way of communicating salient ideas in an organized and rational way, especially during critical periods of time. It's been adopted since then for use in the clinical realm of healthcare. So often nurses and doctors will use this. I'll give an example. So if you are a nurse working on a neurosurgical unit and you need to call the neurosurgeon at 3 a.m. in the morning, you'll need to be very clear with what you're going to say to him or her, and you'll better have a good reason for calling. So SBAR has provided a, a very structured way for someone to hold that discussion or to uh, make a recommendation uh, based on 
a series of events. So SBAR is it forces you to be both clear and concise in what you're what you're communicating, and it's appropriate for communicating ideas, solutions, and innovations to anyone, including policymakers, decision makers, your peers, or other stakeholders. And it's similar in structural format to briefing materials, such as those developing a briefing note, and maybe you do that in your role, or have you developed a policy brief in the past? You'll see how this relates to that work. It's helpful in making a presentation such as this by structuring your presentation according to the situation, the background, your assessment of the situation, and recommendations you have for others. And it's helpful to structure an argument, either for or against something. It can be used both verbally and non-verbally, or written in a written format or, or a verbal format. So it's helpful to structure communication in both of those formats. And it can also be used as, as a basis for strategic inquiry. By that I mean if you were to use the SBAR framework as we'll lay it out and share that document, share a document, a one or two page document with stakeholders to um, garner their input. Is this a feasible idea? Is this something worth pursuing? It's a very crisp way to present an idea for uh, reaction and response. So as I mentioned, it helps you formulate a structured argument either for or against something or an advance an agenda that hopefully will mobilize knowledge to action for impact. At the end of the day, we would like to achieve something, a particular end, and it's important to point to that impact. And it's helpful in many cases for moving from innovation to implementation, or from a, a conceptual phase to an active phase. The way we've used SBAR, or our, our, our adapted version of SBAR, uh, within the, the SPARC training program through the Mental Health Commission of Canada, and that stands for Supporting the Promotion of Activated Research and Knowledge, we've used this to help participants tailor their communications to key actors or change agents when they're wanting to propose an in, a new innovation in the space of mental health and addiction, when they're wanting to move towards implementation of an idea. I've also used it in collecting perspectives as I've been engaged in some strategy development work. So how can we use this format to have others participate and provide their perspectives and their recommendations for what a strategy should contain? I've also used it with students in policy classes to help them construct a briefing note or a policy brief in a clear and concise way. So what we've done is adapted SBAR to, inc to, to include a fifth element, and that is an A that stands for ask. So realize, of course, that it's, it's important to have a series of recommendations, but if the person you're speaking with doesn't really know what you're asking them to do, it's very difficult for them to commit to something. And in many cases, people are interested in helping. They just need to know clearly what it is you need from them. So punctuating the SBAR process with a clear and concise and compelling ask that can allow you to determine someone's commitment towards your, your effort is a very helpful thing to do. And that ask should be in the form of a question statement. We'll talk more about that. So let's walk through the individual dimensions of SBAR then. And these are things or questions you might include uh, or, or be prompted by as you're beginning to develop your SBAR uh, um, communication. So if you're doing it verbally, obviously you're going to want to introduce yourself and your organization. Within this section, you're going to want to clearly and concisely state the issue or problem you are trying to address or the experience you're wishing to share. So if you're someone with lived experience, you would want to be speaking from a position of personal knowing. If you're someone who's working in the field of health services, then you'll want to be basing this, uh, this argument on um, a current problem in the system or an issue that could be resolved by what you're about to propose. Ideally, you'd like to grab the listener's attention quickly by creating a burning platform, as they talk about, or a sense of urgency. And you can do this by speaking to the magnitude of, an, of the issue or problem or identifying an alarming gap in health disparity. This is often a very clear way to get someone's attention quickly. Did you know that X, Y, Z? I'll give you a very, very crude example of, of how SBAR 
could unfold, and it's very quick. So my local hospital, here's the, uh, no, my, sorry, uh, the local high school around the corner from me, the situation is the local hospital, pardon me, the local high school is on fire. The background is that the uh, students were working with Bunsen burners in the, in, the, in the science lab for the first time. The assessment of that situation is flames have reached the second floor of the building. And the recommendation would be obviously run like heck or call the fire department. So a very crude, basic example of how something like that might work. When we move to the background section of the SBAR tool, we're interested in talking about how the problem or issue or, or situation arose. How did this happen? And based on what you know, what led to this happening? And you'll want to consider the scope of the issue pro or problem. Is it, can you speak to something around the prevalence of the issue? Or is there an increasing incidence uh, in this area that would be particular to know about? Are there rising costs, either human or financial, associated with the problem? What is the, what is the, is the crux of the problem and the scope of the problem? And who is being affected? Is it clients, staff, community members, or who else? We then move into the assessment phase where we're, we're interested in, in knowing things like, or you're interested in presenting things like, are there existing supports or endorsements for your idea or innovation? What's standing in the way? Are there any barriers to, to impeding action on addressing this issue or problem? And as we've talked about, that could be political will or ideology, legislative or regulatory barriers. Maybe it's an organizational culture thing. Are there a lack of knowledge or resources, lack of leadership to drive uh, change forward, or a lack of dedicated resources? Has there been a pilot demonstration of what you're proposing somewhere else? Is there a small, or lo small local example of something that has been effective in addressing this issue or problem? And have these approaches been successful? Is what you're proposing scalable or appropriate for spread? These are all things you'll want to include in a reasoned argument. And could it potentially fit what you're proposing with an existing or emergent, emerging initiative in your work unit, organization, community, or system? The recommendation section here is where you would outline what needs to be done to address the root cause of this issue or problem and move people to action. You're considering what solutions are you offering, what actions should be taken, and by whom. And, and, and it's important to ask yourself, can I frame this in a way that is specific to a particular desired outcome? What degree of change would be desirable and in what time period? So, your recommendations should have a certain level of, and there may be more than one, there may only be one, but they should have a certain specificity to them. When we move to the ask section, we're, we're thinking, well, based on the above, what do you hope the person you're communicating with, uh, what, what, what do you hope they'll do with your ideas? What are you wanting them to do? Is this person a leader, a decision maker, a potential collaborator, a partner? What are you hoping they'll agree to do? And it's important to clearly state your ask and be direct in asking for the listener's commitment to act in a specific way. So you may say, will you commit to dedicating financial resources in the current or upcoming budget for XYZ? Will you agree to convene a meeting with decision makers or practice leaders? Will you raise this as an agenda item uh, at your next, uh, at, at, at an important meeting? So it could be at a leadership table. It could be, if it's the government, it could be at a cabinet table. Will you commit to making this a priority for action? Or if you're meeting with a, a decision maker, will you commit to following up with our group, if you're representing uh, an advocacy group, uh, within the next two weeks to further our discussion about a particular idea? Or will you agree to stop or start doing something? So you want to be as compelling as you can. This is your opportunity to wrap up everything you've, you've already stated and sell your idea and get a, a, a firm commitment or not from the person. But at least you'll know where you stand. It's important that you may need something from more than one person to advance an agenda or to put your idea into action. So you need to be thinking that you have to tailor your ask to each individual person. So if you're speaking with a researcher, you'll likely want to be using language that's familiar to them. 
if you're speaking with a client or a consumer, you're going to want to be using likely plainer language. If you're speaking to someone who's uh, responsible for budgets, you're going to be wanting to use language that would, would compel them to act. Can you, are you making a case for cost savings? Remember, again, those dimensions we talked about that are included on the right of the screen in that little schematic. Which one of those would the person you're speaking to be most interested in? Which one of those would lead them to say yes to your idea? So hoping to leave you with an opportunity here, a challenge exercise that you might work on on your own. And this is really using SBAR, SBARA um, to formulate an elevator pitch, a one-minute elevator pitch. So many of you would have heard of this or practiced this already. So if you were to arrive uh, in an elevator and you and the Minister of Health were there or you and the Minister of Community Services were there, Social and Community Services, or you and the Finance Minister were there, or perhaps it's just an important colleague, how would you explain to them in your travels to the 22nd floor of the building in one minute your idea in a compelling way and ending up going through all of the phases of SBAR in one minute. It's challenging to do, but it's really important to have in your pocket for those moments that might unexpectedly occur, those opportunities that might present themselves. So the idea here is that you would identify someone you can practice your pitch with. You'd develop your one-minute elevator pitch and, and share that and practice that with a colleague or a family member. And that person can help you by asking clarifying questions if they were unclear about something or offering positive feedback, which is, always feels good and helps bolster your level of confidence when you're talking with, with leaders, decision makers, or somebody you'd like to influence. They can also, also offer advice on how to improve the pitch, whether it be the content, that you're, you're talking about, or your verbal or nonverbal presentation of the materials. Are you making eye contact? Do they feel comfortable with the pace that you're traveling uh, through the conversation? Uh, are, you are, they, are you losing them? Are you engaging them? Are you speaking in a way that is, uh, that is optimistic and we have a solution? So I'm going to leave you with that exercise as something you can, you can try for yourself. In conclusion, you know, Simon Sinek, many of you would be familiar with this TED Talks guru, uh, always talks about starting with why, starting with the why. So within the first three elements of SBARA, really the situation, background, and assessment, this is where you're articulating why something needs to happen. The recommendation you're offering is really the what, and the ask is the how you will achieve this. So I'd just like to leave you with that simple breakdown. And remember that persuasion and influence are key factors to getting people on board. This can be done through communicating in a clear, logical, reasonable fashion and offering a good case with the right evidence that's valued by people. And again, people are usually interested in helping, but clearly punctuating your idea with a direct ask gives them a clear sense of what you need from them. In the end, this lets you know at the end of the day what their level of commitment is. This final slide is just a little tool for you. Uh, I mean, you can blow this up, but it's just a summary slide I created that allows you to think about in one page what are some of the aspects that you might think about in presenting an idea in a compelling fashion to somebody you need to influence, somebody you need support from, or somebody you need buy-in from. So I believe we have now a series of poll questions uh, that Sarita will Yep, so I'm pulling up the first poll question. Um, it's live now, but the first question is, was the information shared on the SBARA tool helpful? So everyone's saying yes here, Don. <laughs> well, there's probably one dissenter. Nope, you got a pretty good uh, turnout here. Everyone's saying that uh, it was helpful. So, oh, <laughs> someone was just joking. They said no, but then retracted I their no. Yeah. 
Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and then I will bring up the next polling question. Do you see the SBAR tool as something that will be helpful in advancing your ideas? majority of the folks say yes, but there are a handful or a small percentage who say no. And I mean, if that person or, or persons would be interested in, in placing a comment as to why they believe it not to be the case uh, in the chat, that would be helpful to know. And then we have a third question, I believe. And we have a third question. So I will just pull it up. So the final wrap-up question is, do you intend to use the SBAR tool to help you achieve progress on your ideas? Overall, it's pretty good. 40% uh, say absolutely, 53% say probably, and just under 7% say maybe. Great. Well, this concludes, thank you very much for uh, participating in those polls. This concludes my presentation, and uh, I'd like to thank you again. And any questions you have throughout the duration of this webinar, please feel free to uh, include them in the chat. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, for it was a very interesting, um, insightful, and great presentation. Uh, the one-minute elevator pitch I know can sound uh, challenging and da a daunting task, but really, once someone can master that one-minute elevator pitch, it really does make all the difference. Um, and we've seen that through some of our Spark uh, participants who have been able to use that in uh, their real life and. Uh, situations and have come away with um, some really uh, good connections or good promises that have been made. So now I would like to introduce April who will be speaking on planning your social media strategy. Hi, it's me April. Uh, so it's exactly what Sarita said, let's just jump in. Uh, today I'm going to go through what's called the ghost model. Uh, I'm going to go through it briefly, and then more specifically, I'm going to use an example of when I used the ghost model for maximum corporate buy-in, and then I'll take your questions. So let's get into it. What's the ghost model? The ghost model is a way of building a strategy. You can use it for social media, but you can use it for any kind of strategy you need to write. Um, so the ghost stands for goals, objectives, strategies, and tactics. What do those mean? Goals. So a goal is a very large general idea of what you're trying to achieve. Think of it as like a big picture idea, a blue sky idea. It's not about numbers. It's not about measurables. Uh, and it often stays the same even when the other parts of your ghost change. So even when the objectives, strategies, and tactics change. So what's an objective? Do, do, do. Uh, there are measurements that must be achieved to attain your goals. So this is when you start seeing concepts like numbers, concepts like, oh, increase 10%. Objectives usually start with a verb in that sense. So let's nest an, um, an acronym inside of our other acronyms. So you want to write an objective that is SMART, which is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. A lot of people use timely here. Uh, I think time-bound makes more sense because you want to tie it essentially to saying, I'm going to do it within this time frame. So, what are strategies? Good question. Uh, this is the general path you use to get to your goal. So a strategy is the how of what you're going to do. It's not the what. Uh, it's a very sort of broad way to explain the, all, the, all the things put together that are what you're going to do. 
because what you're going to do is a tactic. So these are the actual steps you're going to take to achieve your strategy, which will help you achieve your objective, which will help you achieve your goal. Uh, that's why the, when we saw the pyramid earlier, tactics are the base of the pyramid. So I know you're like, well, that's nice, April, but how do you do it? Here's me. I'm a real person. Here's the thing I really did. <coughs> so uh, how does corporate buy-in fit into this? I was excited when you guys said in the first poll that you're more likely to get a yes if what you're doing will fit with the agenda of the person you're talking to because that's when you use your Jedi mind tricks. So the easiest way to get corporate buy-in is to show your big boss that you will use social media to help them achieve their goal. For example, in the example I'm about to give, I really wanted to improve the number of people who follow uh, the MHCC on social media in French. We were putting out a lot of French content, we didn't have a lot of French followers, and I knew that if I could get a budget, I could increase the number of French followers in a short period of time. So I went looking in our vision statement and our mission statement. Any, pretty much any organization has one or both of those. They are your secret weapons because what they contain is something that you can find a way to match with what you want to do. When you're looking for goals, these are the number one places to look because these are things that won't change in your organization. They're ultimately what you're trying to achieve and they almost never have anything measurable attached to them. So there are lots of different ways to interpret them. Oh, your strategic plan also helps. So here's my example. I went to our strategic plan, which is a public facing document. So you're saying to the world, this is what we're trying to achieve. And we had a part of it that said we wanted to raise the profile of mental health and wellness in Canada, and specifically by creating an internal communications plan. So our internal communications plan was called the Public Affairs Strategy, and it said it wanted to raise the profile of the MHCC with Rockefeller communities. This is great news for me. It's exactly what I want to do. So now we're matching up what their agenda is with what my agenda is. So how did I interpret this for social media? I said my objective is to increase French followers on Facebook and Twitter by 10% by the end of the fiscal year. So this was something that I pitched in December and then I got approval for and started doing in February of 2018. And I said, how am I gonna do this? I'm gonna use paid campaigns on Facebook and Twitter, which I tried to say is one word, to double the current number of Twitter followers and to increase the number of Facebook followers to 10% of the total audience. 10% uh, I chose specifically because it's common in government departments across Canada that your French followers make up about 10% of your total number of followers. Okay, so what did I do specifically? What were my tactics? Uh, so on Twitter, I ran two campaigns, an awareness campaign and a followers campaign. Uh, so on, an awareness campaign on Twitter means that you promote specific tweets, and I promoted them to people who are Francophone in Canada who follow accounts similar to our own and to audiences that look like their audiences. So I looked at, for example, followers of l'Association de la Prévention de Suicide du Québec. So it's a suicide prevention organization in Quebec, for those of you who don't speak French. Um, CMHA also has a French account out of Montreal. I looked at followers from them and people who look like them. So they look for people who are in the same regions, use the same language, in the same age group, and have the same interests. Then the followers campaign uh, just targeted francophones in Canada by interest. So you can choose a lot of interests. Mental health isn't one of them, but you can choose a lot of more specific mental health ones, like bipolar disorder, depression, women's health, seniors' health. So I created a large bucket of things that are what we're doing and then promoted tweets that were specific to that. So if I looked at people who are interested in seniors' health, then I promoted tweets that we already had about the stuff that we're putting out about seniors' health to try to match those interests. Yes, they're French. Oh, my. So then on Facebook, 
Uh, so again, I'm trying to increase French followers. I ran two campaigns, a brand awareness campaign. So this is used data that comes from our Facebook Pixel. Uh, anyone can get a Facebook Pixel and embed it on their website. You may already have one and not realize it. Uh, the only thing that's required in terms of the GDPR is to put um, information in the footer of your website that says that you have a pixel. You can also have a pixel for Twitter and LinkedIn if that's what you're interested in. So I told the pixel to gather anyone who had been to the French version of her website, any page at all, in the last six months and try to target them on Facebook if I could. Oh, what is the GDPR? It's the General Data Project Protection Regulation. Uh, it just came out in Europe on May 25th, but it affects anyone whose website or social media could be accessed by anyone in Europe. So it doesn't really apply to you in the sense that there's not a lot to do. It's simply that if you use a pixel, you need to say so. So if you use a pixel from LinkedIn, if you use a Twitter pixel, if you use a Facebook pixel, it has to say on your website that you do it, and you have to provide information about how to block it. So if you're looking for some general text about that, you can can I please explain what a pixel is? You bet. I'm going to come right back to that question. Just hang on, Danielle. Um, so you, if you go to our website, the MHCC website, and go to Terms of Conditions, and under Terms of Use, there's information about what a pixel, I mean, that we have a pixel that you can also use on your own website. What is a pixel? A pixel is a little bit of code that comes from Facebook, that comes from Twitter, that comes from LinkedIn, and you embed it into your website on your home page so that it is, and it attaches to every page. So if someone visits your website, Facebook knows that you're there. And then it can then use that information. You, the advertiser, can use that information to do what they call retargeting. So if someone visits your website and they come to your page about seniors' mental health, and then you can say to them, if someone came to our website, I want them to see our page in their news feed so they know that not only can they see our website, but they can follow us on social media if they're interested. They, and then once something appears in your news feed and you don't like it, you can say to Facebook, I don't like this, there's always that option. Or you can ignore it, so it's not really very intense. It might only show it once or twice, but it just says, hey, I think you're interested in this. Do you want to also see it in your Facebook feed? Uh, so I targeted people who visited, and then I targeted people who already look like our followers. So it's the same as on Twitter that we discussed. It looks at who's already following our page in French, what are their age groups, what are their interests, where do they live, or these are people who might be interested. And so it shows the page to them based on ads I created. So then we also did a different type of campaign. I did two campaigns on Facebook an engagement campaign. So I took all the people who signed up to our newsletter in French, and I created an ad campaign that targeted them and said, hey, I know you like our newsletter. Do you want to also like us on Facebook? Because then you'll have even more information of the information you're already interested in. Facebook is exceptional if you have a small budget, by the way, because you have tons of options. And all of them, it's whatever budget you have. So I just included these two little screen grabs, this one and this one. So you can see that there's um, a variety of objectives that you can have when creating an ad. So, you, and so you, can, you can see the two that I did. Like I said, I did a brand awareness campaign, for example, and I did a post engagement campaign Oops. on Facebook. So how did this work out for me? Well. Uh, I got my budget, and I exceeded the expectations. I said that I would add 100 followers on Twitter. I added 272. I said that I would add 275 followers on Facebook, and I added 514. So it worked out pretty well. Woo! <laughs> uh, the great thing also about setting these objectives and making them specific, measurable, and time-bound is that you have the opportunity to show your bosses what you can do, which helps build confidence for your next task. So I'm at the end of my part of the presentation now. Uh, and I imagine maybe some of you have questions. Do you have questions? Thank you. Or so for Dawn, <laughs> Thank I should you. say. Thank you so much, April, for a very informative um, and fun presentation. 
We do have a couple of questions, um, and anyone uh, on the webinar, if you do have any questions, feel free to um, enter them and submit them through the Q&A chat um, poll um, under in the bottom right-hand corner. Otherwise, include them in the chat, as Danielle has, um, and we'll be sure to get to them. So the first question is for Dawn. Uh, do you think SBARA could be adopted to other modes of communication, such as email? Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, this is pretty much how I construct my, my emails, and I use uh, bulleted lists, too. And sometimes I even use the heading, depending upon who I'm, who I'm speaking with um, and what I'm asking. But it is, some, it is a format that I use uh, very regularly in my work. In fact, it's also usable, I would say, if you're in a meeting and you're somebody who likes to think through things before you speak, uh, one of those valued people in the room, <laughs> um, before jumping in and making a comment, it's sometimes helpful for you to even use that as to structure what it is you'd like to say at that important meeting so that you are adding to the conversation in a way that's reasoned. So. Um, definitely useful for, for email, uh, absolutely. And I think it, it's, Asbara is a tool that can be used across uh, different modes of communication as you suggested. And when you're doing it verbally, I think it's always helpful to write down um, your Asbara, if it's in an elevator pitch, on paper and practice before uh, your big moment. So then uh, you, it comes across as more concise and well thought through. If I might just also add, you know, this is one of those, in my view, a beautiful little framework that can be uh, widely ap applied. You may think if you've been called um, by a reporter or, or there's the media wants to engage you or you've been asked to participate in a call-in uh, interview, it's a great way, a simple way to, um, to structure it is what you have to share and make it actionable. So Elizabeth just wrote in that she used the SBAR, SBARA for info, infographic for her course. Um, for a complaint, she wrote to the hospital admin about a situation she needed to be addressed. Um, so that's another um, example of how um, practical the SBARA tool um, is and can be. I have another example there, if I can. Uh, the work that I'm doing right now is is developing uh, the older adult strategy for Waterloo Wellington uh, on behalf of our, our local health integration network here in Kitchener Waterloo and it's work that I'm doing with the Research Institute for Aging so as part of this process I'm engaging several groups through focus dialogues and you can imagine that there would be some frustration out there um, by older adults and or their caregivers and often when that is is presented, it can be quite heated, and they're angry about something, an experience they had. So like an issue or a problem, they're angry about an experience they had. And it's a really helpful way to tailor, to take them to a different place, right? So they're starting off with a problem, all right, but how do we help them work that down to, so what do we need, what needs to happen next? And SBARA has been very helpful in helping them to think through uh, a structured way of what, what it is they're wanting to see in a, in a, in a changed within the system of care. Great. Thank you, Don. Uh, the next question comes from Malik. Um, I think this one's for April. What is the longevity of this concept? Can you use the Asbara technique to maintain the social media impact as well? Yes. Uh, what is the longevity of ghosts? Uh, because the goals stay the same, it's actually a great thing that you can use all the time. Personally, I think you should update your OSTs, your objective strategies and tactics, about once a year to show how um, the results of previous campaigns are impacting how you're creating new campaigns. But your goals ultimately stay the same because you're pulling them from your organization's vision and mission statements, which are very unlikely to change over time, they usually stay the same for as long as your organization is in business. 
Uh, can you use Aspara? Absolutely. I use Aspara a lot. Um, I learned it in Spark, and I use it a lot to think through how I'm presenting something to management to make sure that I give them all the background information I need. Because I work in social media all day, I tend to think that everybody knows everything about social media, and I have to be reminded that like my VP may not understand all of the things that I'm presenting. So it really helps me think through my ideas from the outside perspective. And it also can be useful when you're writing just a social media post to think through how to engage people and how to get them to click through. The best sort of clickbaity um, posts are ones that explain how they're going to help you solve a problem. And Aspara also explains how you're going to help someone solve a problem. So there's two really good things that work well together. Great. Thank May you. May I add something? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, one thing that's really important to remember, I think, re remembering that different types of data or evidence speak, speak to different types of people. So while you may be using you know, numbers to, to convince or to compel a certain stakeholder to act, you may be using impact statements or quotes from people within your background and assessment to, to uh, influence others to, uh, to move on something. They are very powerful statements. Thank you. Um, the next question, again, is for April. Um, what are some low-budget social media solutions? If your budget is low, I really want to strongly encourage you to use Facebook for your advertising. Facebook has, um, as we, I'm going to back up just to show you again. I'm backing it up very slowly. Um, so this one and the next one has the widest variety of types of ads. It has the widest variety also of audience identifiers. There's a lot of different ways to target people on Facebook based on their interests, based on think their actions, uh, based on their demographics. So that can really help you out if you uh, need to reach a specific audience, and Facebook is also the most popular uh, social media platform in Canada. So if you are also in Canada and you're trying to reach Canadians, you're most likely to find them there. It's especially popular in focus on communities in Canada and uh, in Indigenous communities, so those are your particular audiences. They're great. And then Facebook generally has the lowest cost per result of any social media platform. LinkedIn is very expensive. It's also highly specific, so if you do need to reach professionals, you may want to go that route. Uh, and Twitter can be really hit or miss, depending on what the exact audiences are, because they don't have the refined tools that Facebook has. So if you have the, a smaller budget, you're not sure what to do, like even 20 bucks, 20 bucks goes a long way on Facebook. I um, boosted a post for 20 bucks a couple weeks ago and then I, and I did it just, it was a photograph and I did it to get likes and I got 514. So I felt pretty good about it. <laughs> April, I'm wondering if you could provide um, a little bit of a, a, identify sort of which of the most popular social media platforms are most appropriate for target audiences if that's possible. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you're looking to reach a broad audience and you're not as concerned about more specific demographics, I'd recommend Twitter. If you're just trying to drive people to your website and you don't really have goals beyond that, Twitter reaches a lot of people. A lot of people use Twitter and they use it regularly. Uh, if you're looking to reach only a youth audience, uh, and by youth I mean like high school age or like tweens, Snapchat is the number one platform that they use daily in the, in the U.S. and generally the numbers that apply to the U.S. apply to Canada. Uh, if you're looking to reach uh, people who are more college age or if you're looking to reach um, women who are in their 30s, you want to use Instagram. And uh, LinkedIn is an extremely professional um, platform, though it is very popular. People often underestimate the popularity of LinkedIn. It has way more users than you think it does. It has way more users than you think it does in Canada, but it is specifically um, a professional platform. So if you're trying to promote something that, for example, would help with professional development, 
LinkedIn is a great, great tool for you. And then, like I said before, Facebook it remains the most popular platform for Canadians of all ages and is especially popular with Francophone Canadians and Indigenous Canadians. Great. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? If not, um, we do I just want to take the time to let you know that uh, a survey will be emailed to you um, once the uh, webinar ends. So please take a moment to fill out our satisfaction survey. Um, this is important uh, for if you'd like to, um, to continue to receive invitations on, for our webinar series as well as it helps us identify um, possible uh, topics for future um, webinars as well. So please uh, do complete the survey that will be emailed to you after this webinar. Otherwise, um, we thank you for joining and if you do have any questions um, about this webinar or about the KE Collaborative, um, please feel free to contact myself or Doris at the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. Um, otherwise, this concludes the webinar and we thank you so much for joining. Thank you, John and April, for taking the time to speak to us today about ESPARA and social media strategies respectively. You may now disconnect from the webinar. Thank you.